afternoon. I just want to cover uh, this point and dig it out just a little bit more, and and then we'll we'll pick it up a little bit again later in the week, the Lord willing. But working some more on this business of faith. I read my text this morning. I'm just going to pick up where I left off this morning and talk again about this activity of faith, the activity of faith. I talked about where it is um, the arena, uh, the area. It is that which is operates in the natural. Faith brings the supernatural to bear on the natural, brings heaven to bear on earth. And the character of that faith is that it bears fruit and it brings order. It bears fruit and it brings order. God will everywhere curse barrenness. He will curse hypocrisy. If all you can bring forth is leaves and not fruit, God is not going to have anything to do with you. He doesn't want just leaves. He doesn't want to show. He doesn't want to put on. He wants something that can sustain, something that can help someone else. And that's fruit. Amen. Jesus was hungry. What a statement. What a statement in this when we see him coming and how he dealt with this, how he dealt with the temple and the things that were going on there. And Mark gives us the more uh, full account of the days and the order of the days. He doesn't give us all the details. He doesn't tell us like Luke how he wept over the city. He doesn't tell us some things like Matthew did about the children, the lame, and, and those coming. But but he gives us the order of the days in this entrance into Jerusalem. The first day the Lord comes in riding upon the donkey and they place the palm branches and clothing in his way and they're, they're shouting. I mean it, the whole, whole city is in an uproar. There are thousands and thousands of people and the Lord has come. I'm telling you the Pharisees are at wit's end. They don't know how to handle the man from Galilee and they get as nervous as a man says a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. They are nervous and they don't know what to do with this man called Jesus. At one point they said perceive ye that we're getting nowhere. The whole world's going after him. <laughs> Hallelujah. I love that. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's where it ought to be in the power of God's moving. The devil can get nowhere amen so they were there they, he comes in the first day and when he arrives at the temple he just looks around nothing is happening or in that regard he just gets looks around the things in the temple turns around goes back to the mount of olives the second day he comes in sees the fig tree curses it goes in cleanses the temple and then they bring the lame and the halt and then the third day he goes back gives the lesson for the fig tree and then goes in and begins to uh, uh, teach them in the temple Temple. And then this will be his final week. And Luke will tell us that he is there his final week in the Passion Week teaching in the temple daily. He will give his prophecy there at the, the prophecy of Luke on the last days and the destruction of, of Jerusalem. He will give at the temple and later that night on the Mount of Olives. But it's in that final week and the Lord is giving these final sayings. And he tells us and shows us this activity of faith. And I want to deal with something here, another point here this afternoon and see how far we get with this. But we talked about the arena. We talked about the character. Now I want to talk a little bit about the correlation, the correlation. There's a correlation that goes on, and I want you to notice it in verse 23, if you will, of Mark chapter 11. In verse 23, he said, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt it, and doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he saith now I want you to notice something about this and there's a correlation there's the heart and there's the mouth the heart and the mouth and a correlation between those things Paul said as we believed we have spoken or we have believed and therefore we have spoken your faith and your words ought to be consistent with your heart it's just that way what's in that heart real faith comes from the heart he said if you will not doubt in your heart but there's a there's an aspect of this verse and here's where some folks get caught up with the charismatics and quite frankly they get it all wrong they get it messed up but because of that it's made us a little bit bashful towards just doing the thing that God says that the verse says and let's notice something here it's a simple word for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain not whosoever shall pray over this mountain, but whosoever shall say unto this mountain. Jesus never prayed over the fig tree. He never stopped and said a prayer and said, God cursed this fig tree and I don't want any man to eat thereafter. He said something to it. 
He spoke to the fig tree. He never prayed in the temple and said, Oh, God, help me and cast these people out. He cast them out. He did it with the word. And he said to them and spoke to them, Get out of here. You got no place in this. This is not the way God's house was meant to be. You made it a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. And so what I want you to understand is that there is this business of speaking. How many times does what we say rarely come to pass? How many times do we speak things? I believe this. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. But rarely does it seem to happen. And I will tell you that what we ought to have as the people of God is a correlation between that which is known in the heart and that which is spoken in the mouth. And we ought to be this agreement so that what we know and have prayed for in this heart when the time comes we can speak you know there comes a time quite frankly that praying is almost is, is going to be and let me say this right and understand what I say I'll try to qualify this to you prayer is always essential but there comes a time when you don't that, that the praying should have already been done and now you come times to speak and sometimes it comes up to where we just need to be able to speak to something and say this needs to happen this is cursed. This needs to be changed. Take this out. Put this in and do it now. And we can see it done. The devil's cast out. The word is preached and lives are touched. Your praying's got to be done before you get to that point. And when your praying's done and you get to that point, you can speak to it and it'll be done. He didn't say whoever prays over the mountain. He said you will speak to this mountain. He didn't say whoever prayed over the fig tree. You will speak to this tree. Be uprooted and cast into the sea and it will be, will be done. And there's God to come to us in that place in our life that we can say it will be done. This will be done. You will have your healing. And it comes to pass as we say it. Amen. Now they would tell us, the charismatic would, would have us to emphasize it's how we say it. And it's the saying of it that creates it. No, the saying of it must flow. Notice that again the correlation. There's something they're missing. For I verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. There's a faith that must come. The saying is according to the faith. But it's not again the saying that creates. There was with Jesus Christ this sense of that his heart was in step with God. And I'll talk about that a a little bit more, uh, maybe momentarily or another time. I'm going to talk about that. But I want you to see this sense that what's really in our hearts. So many times we speak out of our emotions. So many times we speak out of our feelings and it's not out of what's settled in the heart. we got to get it settled right here. There's times I know I've done that. There's times that I felt something and, I, and it was more out of my emotion and I spoke and quite frankly it didn't come to pass the way that I thought or said it was going to happen. But I know also those times that I have declared something. I knew I had a word from God. I knew that it was settled in my heart. You couldn't tell me otherwise. I have declared it and it has come to pass. It doesn't come to pass because so much I declare it, but because God has determined it and we're on board with God. We're in tune with his program. We know what God wants. I'm telling you that when Jesus cursed that fig tree, that was in the plan of God. God wants to give a, a message unto his disciples. He wants to show them that he curses barrenness and Jerusalem Jerusalem's getting ready to be cursed because they have not borne fruit. The kingdom's going to be taken from them and given to another and is bringing forth the fruits thereof and the curse is fixing to fall upon that city. And he says, have faith in God. Again, Peter's amazed at the fig tree and what has happened from it. But Jesus wasn't amazed. He spoke it and he expected it to come to pass. Let's face it. Many times we're quite timid because a lot of times we're just out of tune. There's, there's not something in here that's flowing with, God, with, the, with what's going on in the economy of God. In that moment of crisis, when we need a word, when we need to be able to speak and see something come to pass, then we're, we're not able to. Because we're not prayed. We're not sure about God's work. We're not sure about God's plan. 
and we're struggling and we're just moving along and, and just kind of idling along. I, I, I know that kind of sounds strange to us because, we, again, the charismatics are so distorted that we don't want to talk about it. But I'm here to tell you that we have got to be able to come to that place that as we believe, we speak. And we need to be able to speak to that world with confidence. We need to be able to look at them and say, I'm telling you that God will do this in your life. If you submit, God will do this in your life. It don't need to be a, this kind of a dubious thing where we say it and it's kind of reservations with it and we're just kind of, you know, just kind of tiptoeing around that. There's got to be some conviction. When Jesus said, cursed be thou and no man eat thereof hereafter, they noted it. They heard the authority of his voice. Wow. Did you hear what he said to that fig tree? That was something. That's a strange thing. And then the next morning, that thing looks like it has been hit with a blast of wind and dried up, clear from the roots. And wow, they're just amazed at that. But again, I know I'm repeating Jesus wasn't amazed. We are amazed at our answers to prayers. We are amazed when we speak something and it happens. We shouldn't be amazed. We should be ready. We should know that it's coming to pass. We should have it settled in our heart, in tune with God, and declare what thus saith the word of the Lord. He spoke authoritatively, and the crowds knew it. He cleansed the temple. No one stopped him. The only thing they can do is ask him where he got his authority. They're not able to resist his authority. And I got to ask you too, where's the Roman soldiers? It was a court of Gentiles. They could come in. Where are those rascals at? Where you at, Sanhedrin? Hey, he's one man. Can't you tackle him? He's tearing down your business. He's uprooting all your work. He's running off your profits. He's getting them out. Roman soldier, shut him down. You got a sword. How about it? Now I'm telling you, that's kind of that's kind of authority. But that's the way God's men have always been. Hey, Ahab, it won't rain until I say so. God, God works through him. I, I'm, I'm telling you somewhere, we, we've got to get to the place that we know the mind of God and where we are in this economy. I mean, when Ahab comes again, Elijah comes to Ahab and he says, Ahab, it's going to rain. God's going to send rain. You need to get down. He still had to pray. He still had to go through. But there was an authoritative declaration. This is what's going to happen. Nathan said to David, this is the man. I'm telling you, God has had men and women. He puts those men in places and says, here it is. And they declare the word of the Lord. When God gives us a word, let's declare it. And this generation needs a word from God. They need to see again in the church. We are a people of authority. We can authoritative declare the word of God. We have lost our authority. We have feminized the church and we sit back weak and anemic and afraid to tell what it is. Glory to God. Let's just go one more and I'm going to close. I want to go to this third aspect of the faith of Christ. It's attachment, it's activity. And third, it's abode. I want to talk about the abode of this faith. Where does this faith come from? By the abode. What, what is this faith? What produces it? How does it get to where it is? How do you and I get to where we need to be? Let's look at number one. We're going to look at three things. Just the first one here this afternoon. That of communion. Notice what Jesus talks about it. In verse 23. It's whosoever believe, or speaks and doesn't doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will come to pass. Not so much what he's prayed, but what he says will come to pass. Now, he deals with the praying, and that's the root of it in the next verse. And he adds on and says, Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and ye shall have them. I believe the charismatic separated the prayer from the speaking. But we can't do that. The speaking must flow out of the praying. We declare things because we prayed. And again, we're in step with God. Jesus walked with the Father. He knew the Father's will. He knew Father's house needed to be cleansed. And the zeal of His house ate Him up. There's this business of communion that you and I have got to have. We've got to live with God. And our speaking has got to flow out of our praying. Faith and prayer are inseparable. You want to be a person of faith? You've got to be a person of prayer. If you're a person of prayer, you're going to be a person of faith. It's just that way. 
You are never going to build faith apart from the prayer closet, apart from communion with God. Because if you're going to build trust in somebody, you got to spend time with somebody. You got to enter into transactions with that somebody. You got to know that somebody. You got to get in the trenches with that somebody. You got to get in difficult situations with them. And if you'll get in difficult situations, there are men in this church I would trust with my life. I have been with them through the through the sand. Nobody uh, through the through the thick and thin. Nobody could call me up today and get me to turn against them and say that guy doesn't love you. That brother John or that brother Allen, that brother Cottle, they'll sell you out. I tell them you're a liar. You don't know beans what you're talking about. I know these men, uh, but you see, we sometimes don't really know God. We don't know the God we serve. Uh, we're not sure if He'll deliver us. We hope He'll deliver us. We hope we'll get healed. Uh, we hope we'll have a way out. We hope things will turn out better, but there's an uncertainty. There's a doubt in the heart because we haven't went to the closet and communed with God. We're not going to have a move of the Holy Ghost and we're not going to see this thing turn upside down until we turn the prayer closet upside down. Pray, pray. Prayer conditioned every aspect of Christ's life. His prayer life astonished the disciples so much that they said, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. John was a praying man. His disciples were praying disciples. And Jesus was a man of prayer. It astounded him. The prayer life was, his prayer life was so great. He prayed at all times. He prayed at all places. He prayed over all things. I will tell you, I'll guarantee you what Christ did the night before he got to that fig tree. He was in prayer. I'll guarantee you he's praying. He's seeking God. And when he hit that fig tree that day in that temple, he already knew the mind of God. He knew where he was going. He didn't get there and make up his mind. Now, the fig tree he didn't expect. But when he, when he was met with that challenge, when he was met with that barrenness, he knew how to speak to the barrenness. We're met with the barrenness today of this world, but we don't know how to address it. We don't know how to speak to it. What are you, what are you talking about, Brother Woods? If I can go back to that just a moment. We, we, we're faced with things. Even, even me, I'm asking God to help me. We're faced with dilemmas. And, and we don't know how to answer it. I stood uh, to, uh, to that couple, and, and, and you know, I listened to them as they told me about the things that were going on in their household. And I'm sitting there, hey, God help me, I need a word. I need something to say. And I just listened enough until finally, I mean, there's something became very clear to me. And I knew what the Word of God said, and I knew I, well, what, what God directed me to say. And I was able to speak something to Him. And He looked at me, said, Well, at least you've given me an answer. That's the first answer that I've had. That's the first thing. And He said, it makes sense at least it's from the Bible and it's an answer I'm here to tell you the world's looking answers the world's looking for something they're looking for a word they're looking for something to say and we've got to have a word but you can't have it if you haven't come from the prayer closet Amen. sometimes we got nothing to say because we haven't spent any time with God we've got to learn how to commune with him how much of our prayer would you say is communion how many people could lift your hand right now and say, I enjoy prayer? I enjoy prayer. I look forward to my prayer time, my personal prayer time with God. I look forward to prayer meetings in the church. I get excited about times of just praying. I see prayer as one of the most fruitful activities that the church can engage in if it will engage in it properly and rightly. Prayer has got to become more than just bringing your wish list. I, and I, again, I've got I to gotta get this down to you. Prayer has got to become communion. When you pray for people, that's got to flow out of your heart. It can't just be, I'm here today, God bless so-and-so, God heal so-and-so, God do this and God do that. And you're just reading off your Christmas list to him. No, he's not Santa Claus. He's God. He wants to know do you have his heart. God is not there just to dish out blessings. I mean, he wants folks that are after him who want time to spend with him and to see that this is what God wants. Because if you want it and God wants it, I'm telling you, folks, it's going to happen. <laughs> Glory to God. If it's what God wants and you get on board with him, then he's got a vessel he can use and it will come to pass. We've got to get this idea of communion and we've got to get this idea that I think Pastor Connell talked about this morning, drawing close to God. When we talk about drawing close to God, we've got to quit thinking in terms of distance and space. It's not a spatial issue. It's a spiritual issue. In terms of space, 
you can't get any closer to God than you are right now. Because God is right here. He feels everything. He surrounds everything. All space is permeated with His presence. There is no space, there is no nook or cranny that exists in this world where God isn't. It doesn't exist. You can't find a crack to hide in and God not already be there. And I don't mean he just arrives there before you do. No, I'm telling you, he's already there before you get there. He's already there. There isn't any place a man can go in this world and escape his conscience, which is the voice of God that's going to speak in the spirit of man in him. And that's the candle of the Lord that illuminates all the inward parts of the belly. I don't care where that man goes. That's not just something that, that that's uh, 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 something physical. The conscience is something spiritual that's the spirit of a man and that's God speaking through that spirit and letting that man know and he speaks him that inward spirit you can put that man on the moon and God can talk to him you put him on Mars and God can talk to him and God doesn't have to travel with him in a rocket ship to get there he's already there so God is there spatial wise relative to space you can't get any closer to God he is there the Bible says who's the word of faith says this who's we don't need to say who shall ascend up and bring him down who shall descend down and bring him up the word is nigh thee even the word of faith which we speak we're not talking about when we come to get closer to God we're talking about a spiritual concept the reason we're not near him is because we're unlike him The more you are like God, the closer you'll be to God. The less you're like God, the more further you are away. So when we talk about closeness and, and, and distance between us and God, it has to do with how much our character conforms to His character. How much our spirit is like His spirit. Our attitude like His attitude. Our desire like His desires. That's what it is. Getting close to God means becoming more like God. Getting close to God means that His character is developed more in your life. He's loving but many, and kind, but many times we're unkind. He is full of joy and rejoicing. I mean, I'm telling you that God is a God. Just, just take, take that point for a moment. I mean, God is a God that rejoices over his work and his labor. Can you do that? God looked down, for example, in the creation. He looked down and, and put this thing together. He put the earth together and he made it. And he made this statement when he got done. It is good. You ever do that? Don't tell me you haven't. You have. You ever get done on the project and back up and just take a look at it? Good job. Good job. That looks good. That looks good. We want to keep our mouth shut and we're wise to do so. Let another man praise you, not your own mouth. But I'm telling you something. The point is this. God knows what he did was good. He wasn't being arrogant. He is rejoicing in his works. It's good. <laughs> it's good. Oh, hallelujah. God is making man. And he's making man simply because he's good. I've said it before 400 times. God is not making man because he needs man or because he's, there's something in him that is lacking. He's making man just because he's good. My, my, my. What a good creator to make us how many of you would rather be than not be how many of you are glad that you're here today rather than not be here I don't know about you but I'm glad I exist I'm glad I exist but I'm glad since I exist that more so I live in Christ I'm glad that I'm saved glory to God and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than I am right now I wouldn't want to be anywhere else than I am it is good God has made me and God rejoices in the works of his hands and he serves and he labors but I'm here to tell you he does so with joy but many Many times we've lost our joy in serving. We're devoted. We're committed. But there's a delight that's missing. It's that's something I have to check myself with. I have to work on myself. You know, when you think about God, if you again, God is loving. God is kind. You know, God dealing with us, He deals with us kindly. Me too. I'm thrilled He does that. No one likes to be treated unkindly. And God treats us kindly. 
You think how he deals with you. You think how he has lovingly corrected you and caressed you. You think how God, I'm telling you, and even sometimes in his harshest rebuke, if you will, what an act of kindness that it is because nothing less than that would have awakened us from our stupor. I'm telling you, the wise, a reprover, a reprover on a wise ear will do something. He'll listen to it. The wise will hear the voice of reproof and receive it. And I'd rather have the rebuke, my friend, than I would the correct of an enemy the rebuke of a friend so we come to this business he's humble God serves he's selfless he's true he's benevolent he's generous he's faithful he's good he's holy he's zealous now take those things and ask yourself are you loving do you have a problem forgiving others I'll deal with that later because that's a, that's a point in this passage. I'll deal with it a little bit more in detail. But how loving are you? How able are you to love those that are unlovable? How capable are you of doing good and being respectful to those that are disrespectful? The ability and the truth and the magnanimity of love is such that it is able to endure suffering and yet respond appropriately. How humble are we? How broken? How serving are we? Do we love to serve? Are we selfless? Or we just, do we still have an attachment to ourself? That we are ready to defend ourselves like a she lion over her cubs. Don't you dare attack me. Don't you dare correct me. Don't you dare say that to me. Why not? Are you better than anybody else? Do you sit so high that no one can correct you? Do you sit so high that you can't receive rebuke? Why not? But I'm telling you that our God is humble. You see, it's unfathomable for us to comprehend a person that can have all power, all knowledge, and all presence and not be arrogant. Because you give that to any man on this earth. And I'm telling you right now, nobody in the world could live with him. He'd be so stinking arrogant. But Jesus Christ was a peasant. And though he knew more than anyone else in his day. Though he was greater than Solomon. Though he's greater than Jonah. Though he is the greatest of all because he is God in the flesh. And yet there's none more meek and lowly as our Savior who has been among us. I mean, take yourself and hang it up. I want to get close to God. Then dig into some humility. I want to get close to God. Then learn to be loving. I want to get close to God. Then learn to forgive. Reach out to the unreachable. Try to touch somebody who's harmed you. I want to be more like God. I want to get closer to God. And quit defending yourself. Quit taking up for yourself. Quit worrying about your reputation. And commit yourself to the judgment of God. Oh, but people will misunderstand me. Don't you think, what do you think Jesus is tempted? He's on the cross. He is God. And they're spitting on him. They pulled his beard out. He is absolutely grotesque looking because of what they have done to him. Talk about reputation. Man, what do you talk about his reputation? It's in the dirt. Don't worry about it. His reputation was redeemed because God took care of it. Not because the Pharisees repented. Not because Pilate turned around and said, I'm sorry. Not because he got a letter from the neighbor and said, I wish I hadn't crucified you. But because God raised him from the dead. And God can preserve your reputation if it needs preserving. If you commit yourself to the judgment of God then God can raise you up and exalt you and take care of it he's true he's generous give fill your life with good deeds be faithful be trustworthy good and holy pure and free from sin zealous how's your fire how's your zeal how's your burning in your heart for the house of God, for the things of God. The problem that we have is a dissimilarity of nature. We're vengeful, we're unkind, we're proud, we're selfish, we're hypocritical, we're stingy, we're lukewarm, we're carnal, we're calculating. I've given enough. I've done this, this, and this. I can't do anymore. You start adding up your works, 
and you're going downhill. You start adding up how much you're giving and you're going downhill. You're going to get puffed up or, or beat down one or the other. But I'm telling you, don't start counting your rewards and your chickens and your works because when they get held up to the light of Christ, they just ain't going to be too much. And be thankful if God gives you anything. Be thankful if God pays us anything. I'm telling you, if we get what we're worth, we don't deserve to be here today. Oh, glory to the Lamb of God. But we're that way. You know, it's just like, I can only do this, or I've done this, or that. And, and it's, it's hard in this world. I'm telling you, church, these are things that I have to deal with. These are things that I've had to struggle with. It's hard. When you see a person in this world, and th this world, I know I've said this a lot, but this world is making idiots and freaks out of people. A person can put some grotesque tattoo on their neck. I mean in a very visible place without even being immodest. Just, I mean right slap on the neck. You see people right across the back of their neck. Man, we look like animals. Their legs just covered in tattoos. You, I, I, I see young men standing with the britches half falling off. The underwear showing. And somehow the world has convinced them it's cool. It's ignorant. It's disrespectful. It's disgraceful. Just because the world labels something good doesn't make it so. It's only honorable if God says it's honorable. It's only good if God declares it good. And the world can say it's not shameful, but that doesn't take the shame away. That's what the Bible says. Their glory is in their shame. They boast in the very things that are a disgrace to them. The very things that they ought to run in the corner. And I've said today we live in a place, in a world where there's no shame. I mean, we've got people that can sit in the church and backslide and go out into the world. And then they, they, they adopt the world. They can get a tattoo. They can wear a necklace. They can put the junk on. And then they can come right back in and sit in the church. No sense of shame, no fear, no fear in their life. If I'd have done that, I know there's some things I did I wouldn't even want anybody to know. I'm telling you, but I sure wouldn't have went in and flaunted it before my mom and my dad. I know one thing, folks, I'd have been afraid for my life and to fear God. No way. But where is that fear? Where is it at? I'm telling you, people don't know what it is to be in the presence of God. And in the churches, he's not manifest. He's not there because you get in the presence of this God. He's a holy God. You're not near to God when you're living like the world. We've got to get away from that and say, God, I want to be near you. I want to be like you. And again, as I said earlier, we become like the fig tree. All leaves and no fruit. All show and no substance. I want something real. I want something real. Do you want to get close to God? Then you got to be like God. You want to build your faith? You have to get in the prayer closet. And you're going to have to take your prayer and say, God, I need you to lift it to a new level. I'm not here just to bring my wish list. I'm not here to pray something and boast about how I got an answer. I want to talk to you. And I need you to talk to me. Glory to God. When you have a good friend, Abraham was called the friend of God. And God never abandons his friends. The world will abandon their friends. But brother... When they were out in Egypt and turning away, when they got to the wilderness, God never abandoned his covenant to Abraham. And still to this very day, there's a people over there still that have not recognizing Jesus Christ. They are not recognizing the true Messiah. But because of Abraham, God won't abandon his friend. Glory to the Lamb of God. And I want you to know something. Make God your friend. When you have a friend, you delight to talk to him. You don't mind your friends calling you. Amen. But God will never bore you. 
Come on. He'll never bore you. You get with God. He'll talk to you. Lord, I need a word from you today. I need a word. Let us stand. Communion. Let's get close to God. Let's pray. Let's, let's ask God to help us. Let's ask God to take our prayer to a new level. Let's get the heart straight. Now, the third thing I talked about today in reference to that activity of faith is that activity needs to flow out of the heart. The heart and the mouth need to be in agreement so that when we speak, we speak what's here and what's here has been established. Why? Because what's here has been abiding with God in communion. That's what we talked about. All right? Maybe I went the long way to do it, but that's all right. I, I like the long way. It is this business of us communing with God. What Jesus did flowed out of a life of prayer. And I want you to just learn to pray. You're on your job, and all of a sudden you're faced with a dilemma. Stop and pray. Bow your head over your desk. Bow your head over the front of the car. Bow your head over the kitchen sink. Bow your head over the lawnmower. Bow your head over the steering wheel of the truck. Bow your head and say, God, I need you. Talk to me. Help me. Teach me. Because my concern is is that I may respond like I need to respond and glorify you. But see, that's faith. That's faith. God cares. Faith says God cares. And God cares about what I'm doing. And God is my friend. And he cares about this little thing that I'm doing. It's a part of his work. And it's important to him. You will never get where you need to be until you see that your entire life is important to God. Your activity matters to God. What you do where you go, how you feel, who you are, what you say, the people you're involved with matters to God. And faith says, I trust Him to help me. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I thank you today for these brothers and sisters that have stayed here even today to hear your word again. Dear God, there's some, Lord, are struggling. Oh, help them, God. But thank you for those that are devoted here and giving their hearts. And I want you to do something in them today. I want you to let these principles so simple, God, that I, I have not done justice to by any means, but I want you to help them, that they can take them and learn from them and grow and look at this and build their faith. God, let our prayer time grow. Let us commune with you. I want to be like you, Jesus. I want to be like you. You're never out of control. Lord, you are, are running them out of the temple, but we need never get the sense that you've lost control and that you're just running on emotion. No. God, that's what I, I want to see that control. I want that kind of love. I want to, Lord, approximate your character. And that every man and woman in this church draw close to you because, Lord, they're like you. If we're not close, we're not like you, God. That's why we're not close. Help us, God. Help us. Teach us these principles. Let them burn in our heart. Let them get in us. Enrich our times of prayer. Manifest yourself to us. Talk to us. Show us things. So that what we speak comes to pass. So we can speak out of faith and not out of fear or doubt. That we will not speak out of emotion or feeling. But we will speak out of a heart that's grounded in your word. And in your fellowship. And I thank you Father in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.